If you will turn to Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to continue our discussion on raising the bar concerning our faith. And that those in the chapter of Hebrews 11, they raised that bar. Because of the faith that they had with the limited knowledge that they had, or the limited understanding of the promise, they showed their, their faith in God. And it helps us, as we look to the promise, that we too can have a faith as strong as theirs, and in, in some ways even stronger. And tonight, we're going to look at the promise that the promise it's, itself raises the bar concerning our faith. Because of the promise of these men and women, we recognize that we, in having that same promise, we can have uh, the greatest faith. And we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 20. And specifically, we're not looking at just one person. We're going to look at the patriarchs here and how they raise the bar concerning our faith. Verse 20 says, By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings, or blessed Jacob and Esau. And so we recognize that Isaac, who was the son of promise, blessed Jacob and Esau. I meant to actually go to verse 17. Let's look at this. It says, verse 17, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son. Of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So Abraham, when he's being tested here, to be offering up his only begotten son. Why did did he do this? Well, because of the promise. Because of the promise that God gave him, specifically, he said that through your seed, all the earth would be blessed. And he knew that that promise would come through Isaac. And so he's going to... God tells him to offer up his only son, the very one where he would receive the promise. And so instead of Abraham saying, God, what do you mean? You said that through my son, you would would make all the earth be blessed. Instead, he is willing to go through with offering up his son because of the second reason. Because he recognized, verse 19... He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Well, I think it's important. New King James doesn't say back there. It says that from, figuratively speaking, he did receive him. We know that in verse 12 of Hebrews 11, that Abraham, he, he might as well have been... Now notice, look at this. It says, therefore, one man, and him as good as dead were born descendants and many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So we recognize that through Abraham, the man was, uh, was, was 100 years old. And it said that he was as good as dead and through his seed came Isaac. And so he recognized that the reason he had Isaac to begin with was a miracle from God. And so what, he, what God is asking of him to do is to, to sacrifice his own son because he knew that he could bring him back from the dead. He brought him from a man who might as well have been dead. He could, go, he could actually bring him back if he really did die. That shows incredible faith on Abraham's part. But it's because of the promise that he was given. And so we recognize that that promise continued through Isaac. As was read as, as we began, verse 20, by, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Isaac was the son of promise. And so we recognize that through Isaac's, through the blessing from Abraham, Isaac was in turn, uh, in turn blessed his sons. And so I think it's important to realize that he is the son of promise. And I wanted to go to Genesis chapter 48. Actually, not Genesis 48. 48, yes, Genesis 48, verses 3 through 5. It says, And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. 
And now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are mine. And so Isaac, in blessing his son Jacob, Jacob continued to take on that blessing. And we recognize that by faith, he gave the blessing to Joseph. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And so Jacob recognized that he must pass on this blessing to Joseph. He didn't give it to Joseph, he gave it to Ephraim and to Manasseh. He made Ephraim and Manasseh uh, children of Israel, tribes of Israel, and so that through them all the earth would be blessed. And so we see this promise continuing to be passed down from Abraham all the way now to Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, verse 22 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You see, Joseph, who had uh, been sold into slavery, uh, look at, you can look at his life and see all of the, the wonderful blessings that he was for us. He recognized the providence of God and how that God had used him to save the entire world from famine. And in Genesis chapter 50, he tells his brothers, he says, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. He recognized that the promise had been fulfilled through him. But none of the great things that Joseph did was recorded in this chapter. It is simply the fact that he says, take my bones out of Egypt. That is why he was recognized as having faith. You see, Joseph had become second in command of all of Egypt. And it could have been that he wanted to remain in Egypt. He could have thought, well, this is the promised land. This is, uh, this is better than anything my brothers did for me. He could have said, look at what I have created for myself. And that wouldn't have been his faith. He recognized that, that there was going to be an exodus. There was going to be a, an exiting of Egypt. Because they were to go into the promised land. And so he's saying, I want to go too. Take my bones with you. And he's explaining to his brothers before he dies that they're all going to be leaving Egypt. He is prophesying that they will go into a promised land. That Egypt is not the promised land. And so for us, how does that, how does that apply to us today? Well, we've got to recognize that the promised land is a preparation for the church, which is a preparation for heaven. We have a promised land that we are, that we have been promised. It's not something that God will go back on. It is not something that, that, he, will, that he will fail us concerning. He has promised that he will give us eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And actually we find that we have hope through that promise. We have hope through that promise and that promise alone. We don't have hope in anything else. We don't have hope in our abilities. We can only have hope in Jesus the Christ, in the promise. That's why he said in the chapter before, the Hebrews writer tells us in verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Why do we have hope? Is because he who promised is faithful. He is one who will give us that promise. So for you and I this evening, we have a responsibility to look to these, these witnesses, to look to these individuals who raise the bar concerning their faith. They raise it for you. They're raising the standard for you and I when it comes to our faith. And the Hebrews writer tells us because of these clouds of witnesses, what are we to do? Look at the chapter after chapter 11. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, he's referring back to these individuals we've discussed. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This is Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So we recognize these men and women in Hebrews chapter 11. They knew that there was a promise and that that is why they followed God. And that is why they were faithful. But they didn't ever recognize or know the Messiah. They knew that the Messiah would come. They knew that there would be a promised land. Even those who didn't receive it. We now know there is a Messiah. We know who Jesus is. We must look to Him. Tonight, have you looked to Him? Well, in, in doing so, you've got to lay aside every weight. And sin which clings so closely. So that you can run with endurance the race set before you. What does that look like? What does it look like to lay aside the weight and the sin? It's interesting, there are things that are different than sin that can be weights. Uh, there, there are things in our lives that can literally weigh us down and keep us from running in our race looking to Jesus. Is there something tonight that is getting in your way of, of holding on to that hope because of the promise? Is there something that is undermining the promise that God has given to you? Are you willing to remove it? Maybe this invitation is for you to be able to rededicate your life to the Lord if you've obeyed the gospel, if you've repented of your sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But maybe you have allowed uh, weights and sin to cling to you. Would you throw it off tonight? But maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel. Maybe you don't have this hope that He is offering. Will you look to Jesus? Whatever your need is tonight, won't you come? While together we stand and sing the invitation.